Chemistry of Ideas and Sensations Philosophical problems adopt in almost all matters the same form of question as they did 2,000 years ago. How can anything spring from its opposite? For instance, reason out of unreason, the sentient out of the dead, logic out of unlogic, disinterested contemplation out of covetous willing, life for others out of egoism, truth out of error. Metaphysical philosophy has helped itself over those difficulties hitherto by denying the origin of one thing in another and assuming a miraculous origin for more highly valued things, immediately out of the kernel and essence of the thing in itself. Historical philosophy, on the contrary, which is no longer to be thought of as separate from physical science, the youngest of all philosophical methods, has ascertained in single cases, and presumably this will happen in everything, that there are no opposites except in the usual exaggeration of the popular or metaphysical point of view, and that an error of reason lies at the bottom of the opposition. According to this explanation, strictly understood, there is neither an unegotistical action nor an entirely disinterested point of view. They are both only sublimations in which the fundamental element appears almost evaporated and is only to be discovered by the closest observation. All that we require, and which can only be given us by the present advance of the single sciences, is a chemistry of the moral, religious, aesthetic ideas and sentiments, as also of those emotions which we express in ourselves, both in the great and in the small phases of social and intellectual intercourse, and even in solitude. But what if this chemistry should result in the fact that also in this case the most beautiful colors have been obtained from base, even despised materials? Would many be inclined to pursue such examinations? Humanity likes to put all questions as to origin and beginning out of its mind. Must one not be almost dehumanized to feel a contrary tendency in oneself? 2. Inherited Faults of Philosophers All philosophers have the common fault that they start from man in his present state and hope to attain their end by an analysis of him. Unconsciously, they look upon man as an Setema veritas, as a thing unchangeable in all commotion, as a sure standard of things. But everything that the philosopher says about man is really nothing more than testimony about the man of a very limited space of time. A lack of historical sense is the hereditary fault of all philosophers. Many, indeed, unconsciously mistake the very latest variety of man, such as has arisen under the influence of certain religions, certain political events, for the permanent form from which one must set out. They will not learn that man has developed, that his faculty of knowledge has developed also, whilst for some of them the entire world is spun out of this faculty of knowledge. Now, everything essential in human development happened in prehistoric times, long before those 4,000 years which we know something of. Man may not have changed much during this time. But the philosopher sees instincts in the present man and takes it for granted that this is one of the unalterable facts of mankind, and, consequently, can furnish a key to the understanding of the world. The entire teleology is so constructed that man of the last 4,000 years is spoken of as an eternal being, towards which all things in the world have from the beginning a natural direction. But everything has evolved. There are no eternal facts as there are likewise no absolute truths. Therefore, historical philosophizing is henceforth necessary, and with it the virtue of diffidence. 3. Appreciation of Unpretentious Truths It is a mark of a higher culture to value the little unpretentious truths, which have been found by means of strict method, more highly than the joy-diffusing and dazzling errors which spring from metaphysical and artistic times and peoples. First of all, one has scorn on the lips of the former, as if here nothing could have equal privileges with anything else, so unassuming, simple, bashful, apparently discouraging are they, so beautiful, stately, intoxicating, perhaps even animating are the others. But the hardly attained, the certain, the lasting, and therefore of great consequence for all wider knowledge, is still the higher. To keep one's self to that is manly and shows bravery, simplicity, and forbearance. Gradually, not only single individuals, but the whole of mankind will be raised to this manliness, when it has at last accustomed itself to the higher appreciation of durable, lasting knowledge, and has lost all belief in inspiration and the miraculous communication of truths. Respecters of forms, certainly, with this standard of the beautiful and noble, will first of all have good reasons for mockery. As soon as the appreciation of unpretentious truths and the scientific spirit begin to obtain the mastery, 
but only because their eye has either not yet recognized the charm of the simplest form, or because man educated in that spirit are not yet completely and inwardly saturated by it, so that they still thoughtlessly imitate old forms, and badly enough, as one does who no longer cares much about the matter. Formerly the spirit was not occupied with strict thought. Its earnestness then lay in the spinning out of symbols and forms. This has changed. That earnestness in the symbolical has become the mark of a lower culture. As our arts themselves grow ever more intellectual, our senses more spiritual, and as, for instance, people now judge concerning what sounds well to the sense quite differently from how they did a hundred years ago, so the forms of our life grow ever more spiritual, to the eye of the older ages perhaps uglier, but only because it is incapable of perceiving how the kingdom of the inward, spiritual beauty constantly grows deeper and wider, and to what extent the inner intellectual look may be of more importance to us all than the most beautiful bodily frame and the noblest architectural structure. 4. Astrology and the Like It is probable that the objects of religious, moral, aesthetic, and logical sentiment likewise belong only to the surface of things, while man willingly believes that here, at least, he has touched the heart of the world. He deceives himself because those things enrapture him so profoundly and make him so profoundly unhappy, and he therefore shows the same pride here as in astrology. For astrology believes that the firmament moves round the destiny of man. The moral man, however, takes it for granted that what he has essentially at heart must also be the essence and heart of things. 5. Misunderstanding of Dreams in the ages of a rude and primitive civilization, man believed that in dreams he became acquainted with a second actual world. Herein lies the origin of all metaphysics. Without dreams there could have been found no reason for a division of the world. The distinction, too, between soul and body is connected with the most ancient comprehension of dreams, also the supposition of an imaginary soul body, therefore the origin of all belief in spirits, and probably also the belief in gods. The dead continues to live, for he appears to the living in a dream. Thus men reasoned of old for thousands and thousands of years. 6. The scientific spirit partially but not wholly powerful. The smallest subdivisions of science taken separately are dealt with purely in relation to themselves. The general, great sciences on the contrary, regarded as a whole, call up the question, certainly a very non-objective one, Wherefore? To what end? It is this utilitarian consideration which causes them to be dealt with less impersonally when taken as a whole than when considered in their various parts. In philosophy, above all, as the apex of the entire pyramid of science, the question as to the utility of knowledge is involuntarily brought forward, and every philosophy has the unconscious intention of ascribing to it the greatest usefulness. For this reason, there is so much high-flying metaphysics in all philosophies and such a shyness of the apparently unimportant solutions of physics. For the importance of knowledge for life must appear as great as possible. Here is the antagonism between the separate provinces of science and philosophy. The latter desires, what art does, to give the greatest possible depth and meaning to life and actions. In the former, one seeks knowledge and nothing further, whatever may emerge thereby. So far there has been no philosopher in whose hands philosophy has not grown into an apology for knowledge. On this point, at least, every one is an optimist, that the greatest usefulness must be ascribed to knowledge. They are all tyrannized over by logic, and this is optimism in its essence. 7. The Killjoy in Science Philosophy separated from science when it asked the question, which is the knowledge of the world and of life which enables man to live most happily? This happened in the Socratic schools. The veins of scientific investigation were bound up by the points of view of happiness, and are so still. 8. Pneumatic Explanation of Nature Metaphysics explains the writing of nature, so to speak, pneumatically, as the Church and her learned men formerly did with the Bible. A great deal of understanding is required to apply to nature the same method of strict interpretation as the philologists have now established for all books, with the intention of clearly understanding what the text means, but not suspecting a double sense or even taking it for granted. Just, however, as with regard to books, the bad art of interpretation is by no means overcome, 
and the most cultivated society, one still constantly comes across the remains of allegorical and mythical interpretation. So it is also with regard to nature. Indeed, it is even much worse. 9. The Metaphysical World It is true that there might be a metaphysical world. The absolute possibility of it is hardly to be disputed. We look at everything through the human head and cannot cut this head off. While the question remains, what would be left of the world if it had been cut off? This is a purely scientific problem, and one not very likely to trouble mankind. But everything which has hitherto made metaphysical suppositions valuable, terrible, delightful for man, what has produced them, is passion, error, and self-deception. The very worst methods of knowledge, not the best, have taught belief therein. When these methods have been discovered as the foundation of all existing religions and metaphysics, they have been refuted. Then there still always remains that possibility, but there is nothing to be done with it. Much less is it possible to let happiness, salvation, and life depend on the spider thread of such a possibility. For nothing could be said of the metaphysical world but that it would be a different condition, a condition inaccessible and incomprehensible to us. It would be a thing of negative qualities. Were the existence of such a world ever so well proved, the fact would nevertheless remain that it would be precisely the most irrelevant of all forms of knowledge, more irrelevant than the knowledge of the chemical analysis of water to the sailor in danger in a storm. 10. Harmlessness of Metaphysics in the Future Directly the origins of religion, art, and morals have been so described that one can perfectly explain them without having recourse to metaphysical concepts at the beginning and in the course of the path. The strongest interest in the purely theoretical problem of the thing in itself and the phenomenon ceases. For however it may be here, with religion, art, and morals, we do not touch the essence of the world in itself. We are in the domain of representation. No, intuition can carry us further. With the greatest calmness, we shall leave the question as to how our own conception of the world can differ so widely from the revealed essence of the world, to physiology and the history of the evolution of organisms and ideas. 11. Language as a Presumptive Science The importance of language for the development of culture lies in the fact that in language man has placed a world of his own besides the other, a position which he deems so fixed that he might therefrom lift the rest of the world off its hinges and make himself master of it. Inasmuch as man is believed in the ideas and names of things as eterne veritates for a great length of time, he has acquired that pride by which he has raised himself above the animal. He really thought that in language he possessed the knowledge of the world. The maker of language was not modest enough to think that he only gave designations to things. He believed rather that with his words he expressed the widest knowledge of the things. In reality, language is the first step in the endeavor after science. Here also it is belief in ascertained truth, from which the mightiest sources of strength have flowed. Much later, only now, it is dawning upon men that they have propagated a tremendous error in their belief in language. Fortunately, it is now too late to reverse the development of reason, which is founded upon that belief. Logic, also, is founded upon suppositions to which nothing in the actual world corresponds. For instance, on the supposition of the equality of things and the identity of the same thing at different points of time. But that particular science arose out of the contrary belief that such things really existed in the actual world. It is the same with mathematics, which would certainly not have arisen if it had been known from the beginning that in nature there are no exactly straight lines, no real circle, no absolute standard of size. 12. Dream and Culture The function of the brain which is most influenced by sleep is the memory, not that it entirely ceases, but it is brought back to a condition of imperfection, such as everyone may have experienced in prehistoric times, whether asleep or awake. Arbitrary and confused as it is, it constantly confounds things on the ground of the most fleeting resemblances, but with the same arbitrariness and confusion the ancients invented their mythologies, and even at the present day travelers are accustomed to remark how prone the savage is to forgetfulness, how, after a short tension of memory, his mind begins to sway here and there from sheer weariness and gives forth lies and nonsense. But in dreams we all resemble the savage. Bad recognition and erroneous comparisons are the reasons of the bad conclusions, of which we are guilty in dreams, so that, when we clearly recollect what we have dreamt, 
we are alarmed at ourselves at harboring so much foolishness within us. The perfect distinctness of all dream representations, which presuppose absolute faith in their reality, recall the conditions that appertain to primitive man, in whom hallucination was extraordinarily frequent and sometimes simultaneously seized entire communities, entire nations. Therefore, in sleep and in dreams, we once more carry out the task of early humanity. 13. The Logic of Dreams In sleep, our nervous system is perpetually excited by numerous inner occurrences. Nearly all the organs are disjointed and in a state of activity. The blood runs its turbulent course. The position of the sleeper causes pressure on certain limbs. His coverings influence his sensations in various ways. The stomach digests, and by its movement it disturbs other organs. The intestines writhe. The position of the head occasions unaccustomed play of muscles. The feet, unshod, not pressuring upon the floor with the soles, occasion the feeling of the unaccustomed, just as does the different clothing of the whole body. All this, according to its daily change and extent, excites by its extraordinariness the entire system to the very functions of the brain, and thus there are a hundred occasions for the spirit to be surprised and to seek for the reasons of this excitation. The dream, however, is the seeking and representing of the causes of those excited sensations, that is, of the supposed causes. A person who, for instance, binds his feet with two straps will perhaps dream that two serpents are coiling round his feet. This is first hypothesis, then a belief, with an accompanying mental picture and interpretation. These serpents must be the causia of these sensations which I, the sleeper, experience. So decides the mind of the sleeper. The immediate past, so disclosed, becomes to him the present through his excited imagination. Thus everyone knows from experience how quickly the dreamer weaves into his dream a loud sound that he hears, such as the ringing of bells or the firing of cannon, that is to say, explains it from afterwards, so that he first thinks he experiences the producing circumstances and then that sound. But how does it happen that the mind of the dreamer is always so mistaken, while the same mind when awake is accustomed to be so temperate, careful, skeptical with regard to its hypotheses? so that the first random hypothesis of the explanation of a feeling suffices for him to believe immediately in its truth. For in dreaming we believe in the dream as if it were a reality, i.e., we think our hypothesis completely proved. I hold that as man now still reasons in dreams, so men reasoned also when awake through thousands of years. The first causa which occurred to the mind to explain anything that required an explanation was sufficient and stood for truth. Thus, according to travelers' tales, savages still do to this very day. This ancient element in human nature still manifests itself in our dreams, for it is the foundation upon which the higher reason has developed and still develops in every individual. The dream carries us back into remote conditions of human culture and provides a ready means of understanding them better. Dream thinking is now so easy to us because during immense periods of human development we have been so well drilled in this form of fantastic and cheap explanation, by means of the first agreeable notions. In so far, dreaming is a recreation for the brain, which by day has to satisfy the stern demands of thought as they are laid down by the higher culture. We can at once discern an allied process even in our awakened state, as the door and anteroom of the dream. If we shut our eyes, the brain produces a number of impressions of light and color, probably as a kind of afterplay and echo of all those effects of light which crowd in upon it by day. Now, however, the understanding, together with the imagination, instantly works up this play of color, shapeless in itself, into definite figures, forms, landscapes, and animated groups. The actual accompanying process thereby is again a kind of conclusion from the effect to the cause, since the mind asks, Whence come these impressions of light and color? It supposes those figures and forms as causes. It takes them for the origin of those colors and lights, because in the daytime, with open eyes, it is accustomed to find a producing cause for every color, every effect of life. Here, therefore, the imagination constantly places pictures before the mind, since it supports itself on the visual impressions of the day in their production, and the dream imagination does just the same thing, that is, the supposed cause is deduced from the effect and representation after the effect. All this happens with extraordinary rapidity, so that here, as with the conjurer, a confusion of judgment may arise and a sequence may look like something simultaneous, 
or even like a reverse sequence. From these circumstances we may gather how lately the more acute logical thinking, the strict discrimination of cause and effect, has been developed, when our reasoning and understanding faculties still involuntarily hark back to those primitive forms of deduction, and when we pass about half of our life in this condition. The poet, too, and the artist assign causes for their moods and conditions which are by no means the true ones. In this they recall an older humanity and can assist us to the understanding of it. 14. Co-echoing. All stronger moods bring with them a co-echoing of kindred sensations and moods. They grub up the memory, so to speak. Along with them something within us remembers and becomes conscious of similar conditions in their origin. Thus, there are formed quick, habitual connections of feelings and thoughts, which eventually, when they follow each other with lightning speed, are no longer felt as complexes but as unities. In this sense, one speaks of the moral feeling, of the religious feeling, as if they were absolute unities. In reality, they are streams with a hundred sources and tributaries. Here also, as so often happens, the unity of the word is no security for the unity of the thing. 15. No internal and external in the world. As Democritus transferred the concepts above and below to endless space where they have no sense, so philosophers in general have transferred the concepts internal and external to the essence and appearance of the world. They think that with deep feelings one can penetrate deeply into the internal and approach the heart of nature. But these feelings are only deep insofar as along with them, barely noticeable, Certain complicated groups of thoughts, which we call deep, are regularly excited. A feeling is deep because we think that the accompanying thought is deep. But the deep thought can nevertheless be very far from the truth, as, for instance, every metaphysical one. If one take away from the deep feeling the commingled element of thought, then the strong feeling remains, and this guarantees nothing for knowledge but itself, just as strong faith proves only its strength and not the truth of what is believed in. 16. Phenomenon and Thing in Itself Philosophers are in the habit of setting themselves before life and experience, before that which they call the world of appearance, as before a picture that is once for all unrolled and exhibits unchangeably fixed the same process. This process, they think, must be rightly interpreted in order to come to a conclusion about the being that produced the picture, about the thing in itself, therefore, which is always accustomed to be regarded as sufficient ground for the world of phenomenon. On the other hand, since one always makes the idea of the metaphysical stand definitely as that of the unconditioned, consequently also unconditioning, one must directly disown all connection between the unconditioned, the metaphysical world, and the world which is known to us, so that the thing in itself should certainly not appear in the phenomenon, and every conclusion from the former as regarded the latter is to be rejected. Both sides overlook the fact that that picture, that which we now call human life and experience, has gradually evolved, nay, is still in the process of evolving, and therefore should not be regarded as a fixed magnitude from which a conclusion about its originator might be deduced, the sufficing cause, or even merely neglected. It is because for thousands of years we have looked into the world with moral, aesthetic, and religious pretensions with blind inclination, passion, or fear, and have suffered ourselves in the vices of illogical thought, that this world has gradually become so marvelously motley, terrible, full of meaning and of soul, and it has acquired color. But we were the colorists. The human intellect, on the basis of human needs, of human emotions, has caused this phenomenon to appear and has carried its erroneous fundamental conceptions into things late very late it takes to thinking and now the world of experience and the thing in itself seem to it so extraordinarily different and separated that it gives up drawing conclusions from the former to the latter or in a terribly mysterious manner demands the renunciation of our intellect of our personal will in order thereby to reach the essential that one may become essential again Others have collected all the characteristic features of our world of phenomenon, that is, the idea of the world spun out of intellectual errors and inherited by us, and instead of accusing the intellect as the offenders, they have laid the blame on the nature of things as being the cause of the hard fact of this very sinister character of the world, and have preached the deliverance from being. With all these conceptions, the constant and laborious process of science, which at last celebrates its great triumph in a history of the origin of thought, becomes completed in various ways. 
the result of which might perhaps run as follows. That which we now call the world is the result of a mass of errors and fantasies which arose gradually in general development of organic being, which are intergrown with each other, and are now inherited by us as the accumulated treasure of all the past, as a treasure for the value of our humanity depends upon it. From this world of representation, strict science is really only able to liberate us to a very slight extent, as it is also not at all desirable, inasmuch as it cannot essentially break the power of primitive habits of feeling, but it can gradually elucidate the history of the rise of that world as representation, and lift us, at least for moments, above and beyond the whole process. Perhaps we shall then recognize that the thing in itself is worth a Homeric laugh, that it seems so much, indeed everything, and is really empty, namely, empty of meaning. 17. Metaphysical Explanations The young man values metaphysical explanations because they show him something highly significant in things which he found unpleasant or despicable, and if he is dissatisfied with himself, the feeling becomes lighter when he recognizes the innermost world puzzle or world misery in that which he so strongly disapproves of in himself. To feel himself less responsible and at the same time to find things more interesting, that seems to him a doable benefit for which he has to think metaphysics. Later on, certainly, he gets distrustful of the whole metaphysical method of explanation. Then perhaps it grows clear to him that those results can be obtained equally well and more scientifically in another way that physical and historical explanations produce the feeling of personal relief to at least the same extent, and that the interest in life and its problems is perhaps more aroused thereby. 18. Fundamental Questions of Metaphysics When the history of the rise of thought comes to be written, a new light will be thrown on the following statement of a distinguished logician. The primordial general law of the cognizant subject consists in the inner necessity of recognizing every object in itself in its own nature as a thing identical with itself, consequently self-existing and at bottom remaining ever the same and unchangeable. In short, in recognizing everything as a substance. Even this law, which is here called primordial, has evolved. It will some day be shown how gradually this tendency arises in the lower organisms. How the feeble mole eyes of their organizations at first see only the same thing. How then, when the various awakenings of pleasure and displeasure become noticeable, various substances are gradually distinguished, but each with one attribute, i.e., one single relation to such an organism. The first step in logic is the judgment, the nature of which, according to the decision of the best logicians, consists in belief. At the bottom of all belief lies the sensation of the pleasant or the painful, in relation to the sentient subject. A third sensation as the result of two previous single sensations is the judgment in its simplest form. We organic beings have originally no interest in anything but its relation to us in connection with the pleasure and pain. Between the moments, the states of feeling, when we become conscious of this connection lie moments of rest, of non-feeling. The world and everything is then without interest for us. We notice no change in it as even now a deeply interested person does not notice when anyone passes him. To the plant, things are as a rule tranquil and eternal, everything like itself. From the period of the lower organisms man has inherited the belief that similar things exist. This theory is only contradicted by the matured experience of the most advanced science. The primordial belief of everything organic from the beginning is perhaps even this, that all the rest of the world is one and immovable. The point furthest removed from those early beginnings of logic is the idea of causality. Indeed, we still really think that all sensations and activities are acts of the free will. When the sentient individual contemplates himself, he regards every sensation, every alteration as something isolated. That is to say, unconditioned and disconnected. It rises up in us without connection with anything foregoing or following. We're hungry, but we do not originally think that the organism must be nourished. The feeling seems to make itself felt without cause and purpose. It isolates itself and regards itself as arbitrary. Therefore, belief in the freedom of the will is an original error of everything organic, as old as the existence of the awakenings of logic in it. 
The belief in unconditioned substances and similar things is equally a primordial as well as an old error of everything organic. But inasmuch as all metaphysics has concerned itself chiefly with substance and the freedom of will, it may be designated as the science which treats of the fundamental errors of mankind, but treats of them as if they were fundamental truths.